Turn your Bibles over to uh, 1 John, the book of 1 John. Turn your Bibles over to 1 John. And uh, the title of my message this, this afternoon, or this evening, is just cleanliness. Cleanliness. And, you know, there's a lot of themes we see in the Bible, um, you know, and the more I grow in... In the Word, and the more you you want to you see the the messages that God lays out for you. One of the things that that is is clear is that you know it's not just about getting up here and and saying a bunch of words, but what you're going to leave for the congregation, how you're going to edify them, how you're going to you know uh, help them grow in the Word. And on a Wednesday, it's a good time to just do a different type of study. It's always a good time to go get into the Word of God and um, uh, in a little bit more detail, maybe get a little bit more of that meat. And one of the things that really stands out to me from the very beginning, you know, even from Genesis 1, is you see this separation, the separation of lightness, light and dark. You see the separation of clean and unclean. You just see the, this, the separation between the righteous and the unrighteous, the holy and the unholy. And that the idea behind it is that obviously Christ has covered us, so we're made righteous, but we're still here on this earth. And remember, Jesus said he didn't want to take us out of the world, but leave us but that he would be with us. He'd leave the comforter with us. And so the idea for us as we grow in Christ, it doesn't matter where we are in our lives and whether we're uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the youth of our life or in the later years of our life, we should still always be moving towards that perfection. We know that that ultimate perfection will be when we are with Christ in heaven, but we can do more for the Lord now if we learn these doctrines and we can also win more souls for Christ if we do these things. And so the title is Cleanliness. And right there in 1 John, I don't normally read the entire chapter. I mean, we, we'll go through it before, but I don't normally do it myself. But it's only 10 verses. And I think it's a good setup for what we're looking at. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. And we see that, that that's capitalized. It's speaking of Jesus, it says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was the, with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we say that we have not sinned, and if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And we see this, this dichotomy here of lightness and dark, uh, you know, clean and cleansing us. Obviously, the only, the only reason someone would get clean is if you're unclean, right? And we see that it's all through Jesus Christ. We see this relationship here. And I mean, of course, if we were preaching just on 1 John, there'd be a whole other sermon. But I just wanted to focus there on verse 7. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us, cleanseth us from all sin. Then we look at verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a couple of things we need to do to be cleansed. So obviously, number one, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're cleansed for all eternity. But this is talking to us here also not just in the spirit, but in the flesh. You know, what is it that we constantly have to do? Well, we constantly have to ask God for forgiveness for our sins. We, if we, we want to walk in the light with him. We have to be clean. And if you notice, clean, being clean is associated with light and being unclean is associated with darkness. And I'm going to be speaking to you guys. I'm going to give you 10, 10 things that, clean, that God wants us to be clean in, both spiritually and physically. And I think it correlates or it ties together, and you know, we'll make that. And I won't keep you here till 10. I know uh, Brother Rudolph, is, his bedtime is 9 o'clock, so we'll only be here two and a half hours. I'm just I'm kidding. But we will, we will cover quite a bit, but we will get out here on a timely basis. But if, 
If you guys want to, turn to Acts 10, and I'll just quickly read for you uh, in Genesis 7. We're going to go back to the beginning in Genesis 7, but you guys just turn to Acts 10. And it, God wants us to be clean when it comes to animals. And before that, let me just also read. I, I got ahead because I, I wrote a note in my note afterwards of something that just came up. But Jude, uh, the book of Jude is a great book. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And in Jude 1, uh, verse 22 says, And some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, the one and only God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. And we see that when we're soul winning, we're not only pulling them, but we're hating that garment that is spotted by the flesh. And then we see there in verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You know, how do we get presented faultless? We have to be cleansed from all our, our own righteousness. But there in, a, in Genesis 7, we see that God wants us the first thing. And, and you know, I mean, you're going to be like, well, what does this have to do with anything? Some of these, these points. Well, number one, like I said, this is a Bible study. When it's not, I'm, I'm, I might not have the most exciting points, but these are good points biblically that we see throughout the Bible. The first thing that God wants us to do is to be clean when it comes to animals. And, you know, maybe it's not a relevant point uh, to some of you that, you know, we grew up and uh, even I did. I grew up with pets. But, you know, when a pet has met its end of its life, it, then it's met its end of its life. Right. My parents never we you know, it's funny because when I grew up, if our dog got sick, if it was too expensive to pay for it at the vet, well, then you just put him down. It wasn't that's just what you did. Right. And before that. From what I've learned is, you know, if an animal didn't have a purpose in a farm or in a ranch, well, then you just put it down. You know, you didn't. And, and that was the thing. But now, I mean, we go soul winning and there's a dog at every door. <laughs> and you say, well, what does that have to do with the message? Well, the one thing is, is people are treating them like ch- children. You know, and, and dogs, and not just dogs, cats and all animals are unclean. And you bring that uncleanliness into your house and you're doing all, I mean, it just... It creates a, 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 an environment of being unclean physically. But it also can mess with your mind because you start to th- see things from a different perspective. See, today in society, people will fight for the life of a dog, but they won't fight for the life of the child in the womb. You know, what's more precious, the life of the children? And, and that wasn't really here in the point, but it's just amazing how we've gone so far. And, you know, you see pictures of people and they're kissing their dogs. I mean, dogs are disgusting. I'm sorry to say it. And, you know, I mean, I'm okay. I, I know that we have to get immunity and bacteria and all that, but I'm not going to actively seek to kiss a dog. Like, you know, if, if a dog jumps on you and it licks you on the face when you're a child or even now as an adult, okay, life goes on. But I'm not like the one that's going in here, oh, give me a kiss, Sparky. And, you know, people do that kind of stuff. That's unclean. God does not want us to be unclean when it comes to animals. And, you know, you're there in X10, but just real quick, Genesis 7 you know, and I'm going over here to Genesis 7. We're, we're going to look at the beginning. And obviously the Old Testament talks a lot about being clean. And it's a shadow of obviously Jesus Christ cleaning us on the cross with the blood of Jesus Christ. But we see there in, in, in 7, this is uh, when they're about to go into the ark. It says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And what I think is interesting is he's seen this righteous uh, Noah, and then he tells him, of every clean beast that thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So we see that even when you see an, an image in the ark, he's bringing the animals because there's a bigger purpose than that, but we see that the clean outnumbers the unclean. And, and that's the way it's going to be in heaven, right? I mean, you're cast out. You're, no, nobody that's unclean in the spirit is ever going to go into heaven. I mean, that, let me just make that very clear, you know, because obviously there was, we could, I'm not going to get off on tangents because I'm going to try to stay on, tag, uh, on task today, but we see this, and then we see in verse 8 of Genesis 7, it says, of clean beasts and of the beasts that are not clean, of the fowls and everything that creepeth upon the earth. So we see that God's bringing the clean and the unclean, but the clean serves the purpose. If we look at Genesis 8, 20, it says, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. 
And uh, right there in Genesis 8, 20, we, we just read verse 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every, th every living thing as I have done. So we see that it, in the Old Testament, it was required to have a clean animal and a clean heart to get a sweet savor. You know, eventually, for us in the spirit, if we get to Revelation, and we're not going to go there for because it's not in my notes, but we know that the, the, when the, they're killing the saints in Revelation, those prayers and that blood, and the, it's like a smoke of sweet savor to the Lord. You know, the, the death of the saints, the martyrdom of the saints. But go to there to Acts 10. We're going to see a little bit more. In verse 9, it says, uh, verse 9, it says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the, upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry, and he would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and led down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the earth. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake, spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon. So we see here this theme of cleanliness. And obviously here in the New Testament, the reason I make this point is God wants us to, not, uh, wants us to be clean when it comes to animals. But he also doesn't want us to uh, rely on like these Old Testament rituals. You know, Peter was still you know, living in the old man, and he's like, look, I don't even eat unclean. You know, we can go back to the book of Leviticus where he separated it, and God said, look, what I, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon. And we also see that this is later a picture of him going to the Gentiles. But if God's showing you this example, it means that what he wants you to do is be clean spiritually, right? If we bless our food, it's clean. Now, there is certain things that we shouldn't do with animals, like you know, I'm okay if we have to, you know, I'm not against uh, anybody eating any kind of animal, but I'm not for eating, uh, you know, what do they call that, you know, when you run over the animals, uh, roadkill. I'm not, I'm not for eating roadkill. The Bible also says that we shouldn't consume the blood of, of the animals, th different things like that. But being a former servant there at Venice, I'm okay if you eat shrimp and if you have a good, you know, pork chop or something like that. As long as God blesses it, it's all right. You know, because he's not speaking here about the physical food. He's talking about the spiritual. But he's also making a reference to the fact that anything that God blesses or that you ask for his blessing, it'll be cleaned, right? The second point is that, so the first thing is God does not want us, uh, God wants us to be clean when it comes to animals. God also wants us, and when I'm speaking of God, because uh, there has been a huge attack lately that I've seen, you know, wherever I go, is we're speaking of the God of the Bible, this triune God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Just because I'm not saying Jesus wants, you know, obviously I'm making a statement of that you guys understand. I'm speaking of the triune in the Bible, not this one, you know, very generic God that, that just kind of indwells everybody and it's part of all the religions that we, we talk to. And, the, and, and that's important because people would not understand this sermon if we're not talking about the, the, the right God in context. But number two is God wants us to be clean both spiritually and physically. You know, in Genesis 35, and you don't have to turn there, go to Leviticus 10 while I turn to Genesis 35. In Genesis 35, we see here, you know, and you say, well, how did you get all these verses? Well, I was doing the study on, on, on cleanliness, and the points came to me. And honestly, uh, there's so much on being clean and unclean in the Bible that these are just 10 points that God laid on me. This is not a, by, by any means an exhaustive list. This is not a definitive list. There's so much more that we can extract from the Bible. I mean, we see this throughout the Bible, through and through. I mean, just in the book of Leviticus, you see it constantly. You know, the clean and the unclean, the clean and the unclean. So just know that this is more of what, just the study and the points that came to me. But Genesis 35, we see there in verse 1, it says, And God said unto Jacob, uh, you guys are turning to Leviticus 10. He says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, uh, God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. 
So the reason I chose that verse is because we see both that Jacob saying, and this is right before Jacob becomes Israel, you know, before God gives him the name, you're no longer going to be Jacob, but you'll be Israel. He, we see that Jacob both is physically cleaning his spirit, but he's also uh, spiritually cleaning. He says, let's remove these idols, which is causing us to be unclean spiritually. And then he says, and change your garments. And if I, I wish I had time to go into that. But we see, you know, in the old uh, Levitical laws that when they're going into the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant and when they're going into the temple, they, they, they're putting on clean uh, linens. They're putting on clean britches. They're putting on clean clothes. It's not just this thing that I'm just picking out just because somebody, by the way, nobody here shows up unclean. Nobody, I didn't, nobody smelled bad in the last couple of weeks. And I was like, I got to preach this message. No, it's more of cleaning ourselves up spiritually. But there is a correlation. There is a correlation between the way that we physically act after God indwells us spiritually, if we're growing in Christ. And, and, and it, it is important to do that. Look at, a, uh, you know, and, and I was going to talk about it, but I'm just going to give it to you in basics. You know, the Bible says that we shouldn't even talk about those things that are done in secret. But the Bible does tell us, oh, look, we shouldn't drink blood. There is a segment of the population. It's a small segment, but it's bigger than you think that drinks blood. There's people that go around saying that they're called vampires. You know, that they're modern-day vampires, and they, they go around consuming human blood. You know, the reason that they do this is because they spiritually don't understand this, and they get these pagan beliefs. And what they're doing is they're not being able then, how can you talk to someone that has this belief system and lead them to Christ? You have to be able to preach the entire word of God, right? Or number two, how do you get a church to be stronger? You have to preach some of the stuff that maybe isn't as fun. You know, this is not a, like one of the funnest messages that I'm going to preach because it's not easy to get up here and say, hey, maybe you need to shower a little bit better, but you also need to ask God for forgiveness maybe a little bit more often. And maybe you need to watch what you're watching on TV and what you're doing. You know, maybe you shouldn't go to the mall as often or go to public places that have this kind of, uh, that can create unclean things in your eyes. You know, I'm not, it's not something that I enjoy doing. You know, I mean, uh, even when, when I'm dealing with my wife and, and our family, our, our extended family, there's things that, you know, I've gotten tougher on. I mean, I'm not saying that this is something that I did many years ago, but now I'm like, you know, if there's going to be certain events, we might not go. You know, I, I'm careful about even trying to go to certain parties and stuff because uh, certain family members just don't dress. And I'm not talking about, you know, here in church, I'm just talking, you know how the world dresses. And I just don't want to have to be able to look at that. I want it to vex my soul or my children's soul or my, my wife's soul, you know, things like that. So anyways, I'm just, just follow me here. But God wants us to be clean when it comes to animals. God wants us to be clean both spiritually and physically. God wants us to uh, be clean with our bodies. He doesn't want us to poison our bodies. Now, the, the term I use here is he doesn't, he doesn't want us to poison our bodies with alcohol. But I guess you could transpose and just put with drugs, period. You know, with anything that's going to get into our body that's going to poison our body. And I'm even talking about it as far as even some of the medication that the modern uh, medical industry gives us is filled with all kinds of poison. Even the food that we eat nowadays, the processed food and the things that we do, we have to be very careful about what, God, what we put in our bodies. The Bible says we're the temple of God. You know, go to Leviticus 10 and you're there in, in Leviticus 10 verse 8 and it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, well, let me, let me set this up. Because I wanted to read Leviticus 10, verse 1 real quick for you guys. Um, Leviticus 10 says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them their, his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And then went out, and there went out, from the, uh, there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And then shortly after... He gives them this message. So I don't know what the sons of Nadab and Abihu were doing. It doesn't tell us exactly what the strange fire is, but I'm thinking that they weren't all in the right mind. Because then he gives them a warning. He says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. So I mean, I'm not, I don't think it's a far stretch, and I'm not being dogmatic on this, but in the first verses, God takes them out, and then shortly after, he says, look, don't do this unless you die. He says, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean 
and clean. So God's making a very strong statement here. You know, today, here in Texas alone, there's probably several, maybe not in the hundreds, but there's definitely several churches, even here in Houston, that now have like a happy hour. You know, where you can come and worship while you're drinking alcohol. Well, the Bible says, lest ye die. Don't do that unless you die, unless you're willing to die. But nowadays, people just do whatever they, is right in their own mind. You know, and, and this kind of message wouldn't even be preached in a pulpit like that because they're, they're trying to promote the fact that you can drink wine. You know, wine's found in the Bible, so maybe God does want us to drink. Well, it depends on the context. You know, let's read the Bible in context because wine doesn't always refer to an alcoholic beverage in the Bible. And I know people want to argue that point a lot. I've, I've heard that more than times than not. But honestly, the more you read the Bible, you can figure it out. It's not that difficult. You know, but we're not going to get into that. But let's go to point number four. It says, God, oh, I have here, God wants us to clean our homes. And you say, what does that have to do with anything? Look, the Bible says, especially for a bishop, it says, if you can't even rule your own home, how are you going to be a pastor of a church? Right? If you can't rule your own home, how do you expect to run a business? If you can't rule your own home, how can you be consistent in church, you know, and look after the things in church? You know, most churches, independent churches at least, the cleanliness is volunteered. You know, a couple of months ago, we got a group of us together and we cleaned the church. When I came in this, this afternoon, uh, an hour and a half early, I needed to get a couple of things done. Sister Karen was cleaning the church. Can you imagine if this place was a pigsty? Nobody would show up. You know, I know it's not the prettiest building and I know it's not the newest building, but you know what? It's a clean building. It's something that, you know, we, we take pride in trying to at least make it look presentable. And if there's something wrong, we'll all work together to do that. I think that there's a correlation because God talks about unholy and holy and the clean and unclean. Look at uh, Leviticus 14. Just turn your pages over a few, uh, a few pages. Le Leviticus 14. And uh, if you're there in Leviticus 14, and we're going to be there in verse 48. And these are the laws of cleansing. You know, throughout Leviticus, you see these, these different laws. And we see there in verse 48, uh, you know, after he's given them all the laws of leprosy and, you know, how you notice if the guy has left, if it's going to continue or not, he actually gives them the law of how you clean the house if it spreads. And maybe I preach this message because, you know, in the last couple, I, I, maybe, you know, you start to think about subconsciously what, what triggers things. You know, the last couple of days, maybe for the last week, We've been dealing with a fly, a fruit fly problem, or gnats, right? And I mean, I'm OCD, I think, about cleanliness. When we were going to get married, my wife and I, my, my mom gave my wife one piece of advice, one piece of advice about our marriage. She said, if your husband cleans after you've cleaned, it's not an offense. Don't take that as an offense. He's not, it's not a, 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 a testament of your ability to clean, it's just that he's a little bit nutty when it comes to cleanliness. Like, it, it has no reflection on her ability to clean, it's just that I think I can do it better. I've gotten better about it, by the way. But, I mean, that, that was a true advice. And for the first few months, that was actually something that she had to, to struggle with, and I had to struggle with, was the fact that, hey, my wife is the one that takes care of the home, and she's cleaning the home, and it's clean. I think I wanted a sterile environment. I mean, I've been in the medical field too much. But, you know, Leviticus 14, 48, he closes out, and it says, And if the priest shall come in and look upon it, and behold, the plague hath not spread in the house, after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the plague is healed. And he shall take, uh, and he shall take to cleanse the house two birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop, and he shall kill the one of the birds in the earthen vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the living bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and sprinkle the house seven times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the running water and with the living bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet. But he shall let the, the, the living bird, uh, he shall let go the living bird out of the city into the open field and make an atonement for the house and it shall be clean. I mean, I think this is a picture of Jesus Christ right here, shedding his blood. You know what Jesus Christ is going to do when he comes to reign? He's going to clean house. He really is literally going to clean house. He's going to burn the earth because it's so dirty. He's going to have to cleanse it and purify it. And there's times when we need a clean house. You know, one of the things that has plagued our society ever since about the baby boomer generation is that we hoard we have too much stuff. I mean, there's literally a movement now called the minimalist movement. 
of people that will teach you. You can take courses. You can pay people to come into your house and teach you how to get rid of junk in your life. You know why? Because it becomes an idol. You know, I mean, there's, I actually personally know people that hoard. I know hoarders. You know, there's a pack rat and then there's a hoarder. Have you ever been to a hoarder's house? I have. It's disgusting. You know, it's, it's stuff up junk to junk, mold growing everywhere, dead animals found in crevices. I mean, it's just gross. Did you, did you guys know that 5% of the world population are hoarders? About 300 million people will hoard stuff. Now, that's the extreme of that disease. You know why they have that disease? Because they don't have Jesus. Honestly, people say, what's the cure for a mental disorder like that? Christ. There is no medication. There is no therapy that can cleanse them like that unless you're growing in the Word of God. I mean, there really isn't. And, and the challenge is that that's the extreme. But between the extreme, I mean, how many storage sheds is there in the Spring Branch area alone? Why do we need so many storage sheds? You know why? Because people buy big houses, they fill them up, and then they're like, whoa, I don't have any more space. So now, I need, you know, back in, in, the, in the 20s and the 30s, people had bigger families and smaller homes. Somehow they made it. I mean, and a testament to your, your resilience, because apparently you guys weren't as smart as we are, right? Which is a lie, but that's the way the world looks at it, right? Now we have the opposite. We have smaller families. We have bigger homes, and we still don't have enough space. Because people, you know, they don't have this, this mentality, what are you, where are you laying up your treasures? It no longer becomes useful if you're just hoarding it. If you're just, you know, have you ever, I remember cleaning the garage many times. My dad's not a hoarder, but I mean, he's borderline growing up. We had stacks and stacks of articles and papers, and I remember we, you know, we cleaned the, maybe that's why I was so OCD, we cleaned the garage out more times than I care. And every, every time without fail, we'd clean out the garage, and somebody would be like, oh, there it is. I've been looking for that for years. <laughs> You've been looking for it for years. If it was that important to you, wouldn't you have found it and put it in somewhere like that you needed to find it? That means it wasn't that important to you. And you know what, what you find on shelves today is somebody will hoard the word of God on top of shelves and shelves and shelves, and they won't do anything with it. Remember Josiah, what did they do? They found the book. They had to dust the book. They were hoarding it, right? And then they read it and they're like, whoa, this is serious. And Josiah not only got, not only spiritually, he was already a strong king, but what did he do? He got stronger. He got tougher. You know, remember he got rid of the sodomites. He got rid of the idols. He killed all the false prophets. I mean, he just went nuts after that. Radically nuts. They're like, today, they, in today's day, he'd be a, what they would call a domestic terrorist. But biblically, he was just a man of God. So, you know, God wants us to clean our homes, but I'm not just talking about physically, you know, making sure your house is clean and presentable. I mean, especially if you have kids, there's points when the house is not going to be perfect. But I mean, just, I mean, there's a difference between a couple of toys thrown around and, you know, a hamburger sitting out in the open for 30 days or something like that, right? I mean, even, even this, this fruit infestation, we know that you live in Texas long enough, no matter how clean you are, that heat will get, that heat breeds those fruit flies and that's but all you got to do is just spend a little bit more time cleaning and the next thing you know it's done it's over you've gotten rid of the problem but the other thing that we got to do is spiritually you know what are we bringing into our homes you know what is it that we that that we're listening to what is it that we're watching what is it that we're hanging up on our walls you know i walk into some christian homes and they have all kinds of idols and you tell them and they're like oh no those are just my decorations yeah but they're still you know there's a difference between a decoration like I don't know, you, you buy a, something that has flowers and a nice saying about how pretty my home is. To like, you know, and, and I'm going to tell my, my dad will know that I tell on him sometimes, but my dad has like, you know, all this paraphernalia of, uh, uh, what's that actress? Marilyn Monroe. You know, that's idol worship. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I, you know, my dad recently got saved, so pray for him because maybe that's something we'll finally be able to get rid of. But, you know, that's what happens in homes that feel like they're morally okay, but they're not with Christ 100%. You know, when I walk into my parents' home, they have Aztec calendars and Aztec pyramids from people that have gifted them over the years from going to Mexico. And I'm like, Mom, that's just, those are idols. You know, we shouldn't have that stuff in them. Now, it's not my home, and the Bible says honor thy father and thy mother, so I'm so tempted to throw that stuff away, but, you know, we got to respect it. But that's what we've got to do. We've got to clean our homes.
We've got to clean up our life. Let's go to point number five. It says God wants us to be clean in our marriage life. You know, and I'm going to go through some of these quickly. So just, you guys go to Psalm 51, but uh, for point number five, just Hebrews 13, 4, it says marriage is honorable and in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Leviticus 15, and we go to verse uh, uh, 31, we see this is uh, in Leviticus 15, we're talking about, you know, the personal cleanliness, you know, if, if there's an issue of the blood and things like that, and it closes out, it says, Then shall ye separate the children of Israel from their unclean, unclean, uh, uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness, when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law of him that hath an issue, and of, who, of him whose seed goeth out from him, and is defiled therewith. And of her that is sick, of her flowers, and of him that hath an issue, of the man, and of the woman, and of him that lieth with her, that is unclean. You know what it's saying? It's saying this is, this is the product of these individuals that are basically fornicating. That are doing things outside of the marriage confines, right? That are either married and committing adultery, or they're single and they're cohabitating and living ungodly lives. Go, I encourage you, just go to the CDC website and read the statistics on sexually transmitted diseases. It's disgusting. I mean, our country is plagued with disease of uncleanness because people are doing all kinds of unclean things. They're not willing to get married. They're not willing to commit their life. People say, well, I've been with, with so-and-so for so many years. I mean, why do I have to get married? I don't know. God says you have to get married. That's it. I mean, I can give you a litany of reasons, but if you can't accept the fact that God told you to do it, well, then maybe you're not living for God. You know, it's funny. I went to uh, the Red Hot Preaching Conference in Sacramento a couple weeks ago, and we went out so and there was a guy in the back of the car. What's interesting is he just recently got saved. He's a Hispanic guy, and he was at the church in uh, Vancouver called Sure Foundation Baptist Church, and he, he, he attended the marriage of one of the pastor's daughters. And he's like, oh, oh, pastor, you know, that, this is a great wedding. Uh, he was telling me, this is his story, so I'm not making stuff up. He's like, that, this is a great wedding. He goes, you know what? I've been thinking of getting married with my, my wife. Think about what he said. He literally, this is, he said that. He said, I've been thinking of getting married with my wife for several years now. And so the pastor turned to him and said, you're not married? Because they showed up as a couple with kids. He's like, no. He goes, oh, well, we got to take care of that. And he goes, well, why? He goes, it's never been important to me. I don't care about getting married. And the pastor just showed him the word of God. And he said, well, if God says it, then I'm going to do it. Seven days later, him and his wife got married. You know, when you hear the word of God, you just do it. You don't have to understand everything about it. And, you know, and then later on, the real truth came out. You know why he didn't want to get married? Because the Catholic Church charges a lot of money for you to get married. But a good old Baptist church, sometimes the preacher didn't even get paid. To do the ceremony and that's the truth because we don't you know we don't we're not doing this for the money we're doing this so you're living for christ you know that's a real important point so let's go uh to point number six we, we got a couple more and then we'll close out we'll make these quick it says god is the only one uh, or uh, the point that i'm making is god is the only one that can clean the sin in your life if you go to psalm 51 verse 1 it says to the chief musician a psalm of david when nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into bathsheba have mercy upon me what did he do? Commit adultery. It was unclean. O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Verse 7. Perch me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide my face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. I love that word free spirit, because what is salvation? It's free, right? You can't get the Holy Spirit unless you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people always want to throw David in your face when they're trying to justify adultery. But they won't go to Psalm 51 where David... I mean, David's like, he's really uh, sorrowful, and he's really sorry about what he did, right? You know what, what the difference was? David was a man after God's own heart. 
Now the Bible says, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. So I'm not preaching a message here to say, hey, you know, go home and be perfectly clean. We're not. But there is a process of maintaining cleanliness in our life. You know, go to uh, Matthew 23. God wants us to clean, to be clean for the right reasons. No, don't do this so you can pat yourself on the back. Don't do this so that men can look at you. People do that since the day of Jesus walking the earth. Matthew 23, verse 25 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Yeah, it's interesting that he's talking to the Pharisees like that. He says, Thou blind Pharisee, clean, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye... Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. There is a correlation. You know, these priests go around and they look all clean and proper on the outside. These Catholic priests, and they're dirtiest individuals to walk the face of this earth. Abusing and molesting little children left and right. But they want everybody to see, oh, look at my nice robe and my beautiful... God says, look, you're doing it for extor extortion and excess, right? And what did he say? You're full of dead men's bones. Why did he say that? Because they're twice dead, the Bible says in Jude. Twice dead, meaning they're already dead men walking. They have no hope of salvation. He says, woe unto you. And we should be calling them out. I had a call today. I led a guy to salvation last week uh, down in the, in the valley. And then um, I remember we were talking, and he was talking about the Catholic Church. And I said, you know, an excuse... Uh, I, I got a little crass, and well, I mean, excuse it because it sounds crass, but the reality is God, you know, and I said, oh, you know, I don't like dealing with queers and fags because we're talking a man to man conversation. He goes, well, I don't like that you say that because I don't think that God would ever say that. I said, okay, well, I said, look, you're growing in Christ. You don't have to say that. I'm just telling you one on one that that's how, the way I feel about those individuals. So he called me today. He's like, hey, I was reading John 8, and, uh, you know, where they, they brought out the, the adulteress and Jesus didn't want to stone her, and he wrote, on, you know, you, you guys know the, the story, right? He's like, he, he has to come in, uh, no sin, throw the first stone, or cast the first stone. I said, okay, well, that's good. And, uh, and he said, so see, Jesus wouldn't be like that. I said, well, did you already read John 6? And he was like, yeah. I said, well, maybe you should go back and read John 6, where he said after this time, his disciples left them because they said this is a hard saying. You know, who can know it? And they were offended because he was hard on them. You know, what's interesting is, and, and what, what's beautiful about this guy, you, you don't get this type of, you know, when we go door knocking, sometimes people get saved and they don't change their life. That, salvation is not like that. But there's times when people do. You know, Paul had a radical, I mean, a, a radical change, not only spiritually, but in his ministry. I mean, he went immediately from persecuting to being persecuted. So this guy, he's reading his Bible and he's learning. And what is interesting, I said, look, you're growing in Christ. I said, you don't have to be in the same place we are. You're saved by grace. But if you study the Bible, you'll get to the same point where you'll hate certain things that God hates because they hate you too, and they hate God. And what was interesting is when we hung up, he was like already more on my side than on his side. What's interesting is it's not my side. It's God's side. You know, I just showed him scripture that was clear because I explained, you know, some of the Levitical laws and why certain things. And we don't have time for that. But it's interesting how all of a sudden things will take. And he's like, you know what? Maybe I do need to go back and read some of this stuff. Go over to uh, 2 Peter 2, and I'll just read for you the, the other verses. And Luke 11 says, and he spake, in verse 37, he says, and he spake a certain Pharisee, besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, now, you, now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness, or ravening and wickedness. You know, are we full of wickedness or are we clean spiritually? Point number eight is God wants us to clean our mind. You know, John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, take, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purcheth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You know, if you've ever pruned anything, just because for the sake of time I'll go quick, why do you prune a rose bush? 
I pruned many a rose bush in my day because my grandma taught me. The reason you prune is so that it can, you purge the bad stuff so that it can, uh, so it can get a, a new, like a new wind. You give it better energy, better nutrients, and it grows more beautiful. Well, one of the reasons you also do that is every once in a while, especially rose bushes in, in Texas, they get this thing called plague. You know, these little yellow and black spots on the leaves. Well, if you just cut the branches off, it doesn't affect the root, the vine. Right? What is God doing here? That's how he cleanses. You know, we're doing it for the right reasons. Are we letting God clean up our life? And are we cleaning up our life so we can better serve the Lord? Or are we cleaning up like the Mormons do where they ride around in their bicycles and their shirt, nice white shirt and tie, only to lead people to hell? You know, I'd rather see a guy in shorts and a t-shirt soul winning all day long than a Mormon. I can't stand it when I see a Mormon. You know why? Because I know people are going to hell. They're going to hell in a handbasket thinking that they're okay because they, they clean outside, but on the inside, what is it? They're, rav they're, they're full of ravening and wickedness. Go to your second and second Peter. Look at verse 18 of chapter 2, Second Peter 2, uh, verse 18, and we'll start closing this thing up. It says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter and is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to know the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened... Uh, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned into his own vomit again and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Have you ever washed a pig? You know, people that have, I've never had a pig as a pet, but people that have pigs, you got to keep them indoors because the minute you let them out, what are they going to do? They're going to find the dirtiest place to wallow, right? Have you ever seen a dog vomit and then a few minutes later go back to eat the vomit? I've seen that. I've seen cats do that. You know what I also saw? I remember this stayed in my mind so vividly. We used to go out to a ranch near the border of Mexico that was family. I remember one time I saw they had uh, roosters and chickens, and I saw a bunch of chickens, and they, you know, they went to the restroom, number two. And then I saw the other chickens come and eat up the stuff that the other chickens did. I mean, it's unclean. We're not animals. You know, we should have a different, we should be better than that, right? Let's go to point number nine, ten. Number nine is God wants us to be clean, because he's cleansing us for all eternity. We should already be prepared for what he's already done spiritually for us. You know, in Revelation 19, he says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. By the way, this is Jesus Christ at the end of the Bible. You know, when they say, well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible, you need to read the Bible a little bit more, because he's judging and he's making war. It says, His eyes were a flame of fire, as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. There is going to be a time when we're going to be fully clean. So we should work for it. You know, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of these verses for the sake of time. But the last point that I want to make is God wants to clean you up entirely. You know, God doesn't want you to just get saved. We think it's important. I have people ask me all the time, you know, what about all the people that you lead to the Lord? In the last two years, we probably led something like 600 people to the Lord uh, here, you know, in our ministry. Where are they? Here in the church. Salvation is the cleansing of the spirit. But the cleansing of the flesh and the spirit requires a walk with Christ. You know, and... That's what's important is that we continue to preach the word of God and we're not going to get, you know, for the, the hundreds or maybe thousands of people we lead to Christ, the numbers will always be less in church. You know why? Because sometimes it's too, you know, once you get the, once you're in, you're kind of lazy about it, right? Have you ever heard those stories of great athletes and they're like, oh, that guy could have been so much better than so-and-so and he had so much talent, but he wasted his talent. But on the other hand, this guy I mean, he worked. He was first in and first out and first in and first out for years. And he's the greatest of all time. And this guy, nobody heard of him ever again. Why? Because sometimes we take it for granted. We know we're saved by grace, 
And then that's it. We just take the whole word of God for granted. But God's given, a, uh, given us a word that we might grow in his, in his grace, right? And, you know, I have so much scripture here, but I'm not, for the sake of time, go to Hebrews 9, and then we're going to close in Titus. But go to Hebrews 9. God wants, us to, God wants to clean us up entirely. He says, but Christ, in verse nine, uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 11, and then go to Titus, which is only a few pages to your left. You know, Hebrews, Philemon, Titus. But you're in Hebrews 9. It says, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For of the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. You see that point he, they make there? It's of the flesh. That's what the Old Testament just did, is it just kept the flesh in order, right? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself with spot, without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You know what purges your, uh, purges your conscience? The spirit that is offered without spot. You know, when we're in the spirit, that's when we're at our best. When we're in the flesh, we're just going to cont continually fail. And let me tell you, that battle is real. This battle of, you know, there's time. I'm going I'm to tell myself a little bit and I'll close out. There's nights where I'm just so tired that I just don't feel like brushing my teeth. I don't, you know, it's not a, a very often occurrence, but every once in a while, I just go to bed without brushing my teeth. You know, and you're like, oh, that pastor, that's disgusting because, you know, everybody wakes up with bad breath. But that's what happens when you're in the flesh, right? The flesh grows weary. It says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know how I keep my teeth in check? If I faint not by brushing my teeth at night, every night. But the, the challenge is that we focus on the wrong things. You know, God wants to clean us up entirely, but the focus has to be on the Word of God. It has to be on His glory, on His divine power. Not on the things that we do and people notice of us, the things that we do because God wants us to do them. Right? We don't go soul winning so that people can pat us on the back. We go soul winning so people don't go to hell. You know, I've kept the numbers, and let me tell you, they're not even that accurate. We keep them just to motivate ourselves, but honestly, the numbers are irrelevant in the sense of accolades for ourselves. Now, they're relevant for Christ. People are celebrating in heaven for each one of those souls that we've led to Christ. For each one of those souls that, you know what's even better? If we can get some of those to show up and then turn around and do the same thing. But we can't do that if we don't talk about, hey, clean up your life a little bit. You know, you used to drink. Don't drink anymore. You know, you used to do these things. Don't do them anymore. Go to Titus 2, and we'll close out with this, and we're done. It says in verse 1, But speak thou the things which have become sound doctrine. This is a sound doctrine. This doctrine of clean and unclean is sound from the beginning all the way to the end. Go to verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from what? From all iniquity. And then this is just a synonym. 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 I'm, maybe I'm hungry, but synonym for clean it says and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority let no man despise thee so you say why are you preaching on something like this because the bible instructs me to speak and exhort and rebuke and it gives me the authority and it says don't let anybody despise you in other words people are going to make fun of me but it's not going to bother me if i'm speaking the word of god you know, I get it all the time, all the time. Not just this guy that called me, but all the time. Don't talk about the Seventh-day Adventists, especially them because I pick on them. Don't talk about the Catholics. Well, the Bible says we need to talk about everything that's unclean. You know, and there's nothing more unclean than a false prophet leading people to hell. Because when your spirit is unclean, forget about your house being clean, forget about you being clean. When your spirit is unclean, you know where you're ending up? In hell for all eternity. 
You know, I just keep thinking. I don't know why I've been thinking about that for this last year. But there's that guy, the rich man, right now, and I said that a couple weeks ago, and even right now, it just rings true more all the time. He's in hell. And he's wishing that somebody would go and talk to his fifth, sixth, hundredth, ten thousand generation of family and would preach the word of God. And, and what did God say? I mean, what did Abraham say? Look, they have Moses and the prophets. They didn't listen. You know why? Because it's our responsibility to preach the word of God. It's not the miracles. And it's coming quick. Las Vegas was pretty unclean last week with a bunch of locusts. You say, well, what does that have to do with the message? I mean, God sent a lot of unclean things to a country called Egypt when he let the Israelites out. So I don't think it's a coincidence that things are going to start. We're going to start seeing more of this stuff. So we need to clean up our lives. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach on a Wednesday night. It's always uh, fun to preach on a Wednesday night to the, those that are true and through. And to be able to just come with a, uh, a more in-depth message or maybe something that God's laid on your heart that uh, you know, we can kind of expound and look upon. And this thing of cleanliness is important in our lives. It's not just important physically, but more importantly, spiritually, Lord. I mean, what is it that we're spending our time in? Uh, where are we investing our efforts? What are we, uh, what are we laying our eyes on? What is it that we allow to uh, sear or, or come into, not sear, but what is it that we, we allow to invade our subconscious that then is revealed later? Of the, you know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Help us to just clean up our language, clean up our, our attitudes, clean up our, uh, our walk with you, the way we, we view our brothers and sisters in Christ, and help us to be more compassionate, Lord, more loving towards those that are lost. And, I mean, honestly, I believe that there is a correlation because it's in your word. I don't know all the answers. I don't have every scientific fact for it. But if you said it, then it's true. So we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.